Hello and welcome to another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action, a series where leaders look back at decisions they've made and consider a series of questions. I'm Peter Stiepelman, I'm your host, and I'm an imperfect leader. I spent more than 20 years teaching and leading, first in the Oakland Public Schools in Oakland, California, and then in the Midwest, Missouri to be exact, where I was a teacher and a principal and assistant superintendent and then the superintendent of the fourth largest district in the state. I'm constantly striving to learn from my experiences and from the experiences of other leaders. The aim of this podcast is to lift the learning and lift the imperfect leaders up. That way, when you hear the term imperfect, you'll see strength. Strength from the candor needed to recognize imperfection as a real advantage. Let's get started. Hello, imperfect leaders. You can now pre-order my book, An Imperfect Leader, Human-Centered Leadership and After Action, by going to Amazon and Barnes & Noble or at the website of my publisher, Roman & Littlefield, and clicking on that pre-order button. I'm told pre-ordering is an important part of the book publishing process, so thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. My guest this week is so good. It had been suggested I talk to him because he's smart, he's compassionate, he's deeply reflective about his leadership practices, he's a principal, has been for 20 years. So where's the but in the sentence? You know how when people say like, oh, I love so-and-so so much, I wouldn't say anything disparaging, but I promise you, there is no but here. However, I had resisted inviting my guest, Matt Hornbeck, because I knew it was going to challenge my fixed mindset on charter schools, and I wasn't ready to be challenged. So really, I'm the butt in this whole thing because Matt helped me apply a growth mindset as I considered how charter schools can be great partners in the education landscape. Matt's charter school in Baltimore, Maryland is a neighborhood school. It enrolls the kids in the neighborhood. It adheres to Baltimore school rules and regulations. And it is so different from the for-profit predatory ones that we have witnessed in other parts of the nation. And we don't even talk about charter schools. We talk about relationships and we talk about restorative practices. And he describes exactly what that process looks like about fixing what has been broken. We talk about the early years of leadership and what was learned about focusing more on what you want as opposed to documenting what you don't want. Yeah, we we don't talk about charters. And, so not but, I wanted to just say that he has me thinking more flexibly on the topic. Matt is terrific. Thanks for tuning in. Today on An Imperfect Leader, Matt Hornbeck is my guest. Matt is an established leader in Baltimore, Maryland. Before becoming a principal at Hampstead Hill, a Baltimore City charter school, he was an educational consultant with large urban districts on resource allocation and principal training. And he holds a master's degree in educational administration as well as a law degree. He's the son of a former superintendent. His father was Maryland State Superintendent and then later served as superintendent of the Philadelphia Public Schools. Matt, welcome to an imperfect leader. So glad to be here. As I learned more about you, I found a 2018 Baltimore Sun project called Roughly Speaking, where they asked principals, you being among the five that were interviewed, what it was like to run a Baltimore city school. And at that point, you were in your 15th year. In that conversation, you talked about a number of core components to successful schools, one being the benefits of incorporating restorative practices in your school. I wonder for those who are listening who may not be familiar with restorative practice, can you talk a little bit about that? And then particularly on the spectrum of restorative practices, there's something called a restorative conference. And I'm kind of curious if you wouldn't mind describing one that you had been a part of. Of course, thank you, Pete. And thanks for this podcast and all you do to highlight such important issues to students, staff and families and uh, to superintendents because um, talking to practitioners is so important and you are in it, in it. and so I appreciate that. Um, in terms of restorative practices, I'll, I'll start with saying that all schools and districts have usually have the word joy in their mission statements. And joy is something hard to put your finger on and manufacture. And I think that our implementation over the last now 18 years of restorative practices, this is my 20th year here, Um, is really a key component of why there's joy at our school. And we have about 900 students and 100 staff members. It is the difference between 
having people want to come to work, want to come to school, and not want to come to work and not want to come to school. When you implement restorative practices well and adults and students feel seen and heard, which is the whole point of restorative practices, then attendance goes up and tardies go down. And I think achievement is directly linked to all of that as well. And we, we really have really succeeded with that and have a very mature implementation of restorative practices. It's sort of like Charlie Brown's teacher, which if you recall from way back when, uh, didn't have a voice. Rah, 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 rah. Kids are always asked, why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? And it just sounds the same from every adult to every kid, whether they're five or 15 years old. And with restorative practices, you really, we train staff to ask three questions. And well, first, let me start by saying on the continuum that you mentioned, Pete, um, first you start with doing a lot of community building circles. We do those at least three times a week and we have circle logs that teachers turn in. We share questions between the 29 homerooms and could be a simple question, just like, what'd you do this weekend or what are you gonna do this weekend? Could be what's your favorite color or candy bar, that kind of stuff. We model it in our faculty meetings and we say, uh, tell us your te a teacher you remember and why, and it builds community and creates those connections between people and kids. And then we're trained to, to ask three questions when there's conflict, and there's always gonna be conflict. City hall, uh, central school, uh, district headquarters, school, there's gonna be conflict wherever. You know, whether it's mean girls in middle school, whether it's somebody knocking somebody's notebook out of their hand, something on recess, there's going to be conflict. And so that should be part of the expectation. And the way that restorative practices works and is so successful, we're at, we ask, we get the kids together, what happened? So both sides get to tell their story. You know, she wouldn't let me come to her birthday party. He posted something on Insta, you know, whatever it is that, that's the conflict. And, and the other side says, well, you know, we used to be friends and we, they, she won't let me sit with her at lunch. And adults have very similar conflicts. Um, and then the second question is, uh, who was affected? and building some empathy, right? Well, your mom's gonna be affected because she's not gonna like it when I call home and talk about the rough day you're having. The teacher is affected because they can't get through the lesson that they had planned. And um, you're affected because you're not in class, you're sitting here talking to me and build some empathy, right? And they kind of go through that. And kids of all ages can kind of get that. And the third question is the magic. The third question is the one that really is the being seen and heard piece of this. What do you need to move on? And uh, what you need to move on can be simply, uh, I just wanted to say what happened, or I'd like my locker moved, or I'd like my cubby moved, or I'd like to sit somewhere else at lunch. So um, that is, uh, if we do that over and over and over, and you build community with these circles, and then you, you have these restorative conferences where it can be serious matters as well. There could have been a fight. And let me be clear that restorative practices is not a substitute for the more traditional consequences. It is a, a supplement that dramatically reduces suspensions and office referrals and detentions and all those, all those metrics that superintendents and principals are faced with uh, numbers, the demographic data behind those numbers and the stories behind those numbers. Um, restorative practices are very good at reducing those numbers. But if there's been a fight and somebody has is coming back after a one day suspension and there's a restorative conference and we have our detention set up for middle school students so that it's restorative. There's some coaching on, you know, what happened, how, what could you do differently? There's a little protocol that the people who staff detention would go through. Same with the return from suspension. We may have, we certainly have an administrator, but may have, and a parent, but we may have, um, two or three students there together who had conflicts um, in the previous day or our previous week. We may have teachers there, the, um, we have counselors. Um, there have been times when we'll have school police officers um, with us. And um, again, that format is talk about what happened, who was affected, what do you need to move on? Sometimes there can be a contract written. Letting the adults know that um, everyone is aware of everything that's happening and on the same page. You mentioned letting, uh, describing a particular conference. And one that comes to mind is uh, last uh, spring, there were two girls um, who had a lot of conflict, ongoing conflict, 
kind of cumulative conflict. Their friends were egging them on. This kind of what you can imagine from either movies or your own memories of middle school. So we, uh, we, we worked with them for a while. We tried all the um, interventions and kind of conferences with each kid and, and uh, decided to have a large restorative conference in the library. Both sets of parents came, both girls came, our director of restorative practices came. I was there, an assistant principal was there. And uh, we went through that protocol. Once the girls got to explain to each other in front of their teachers and administrators and parents what was happening, and you couldn't kind of hear the half-truths or misunderstanding that happens when you are uh, talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, then it gets real, real quick. The girls came together and really felt good about the outcome. And for the rest of that uh, school year and, and this school year, which is their eighth grade year, there have been no conflicts between those two students. That community that's built because of that process is an important part of our success. Um, and a little, little uh, to bury the lead, we just had for the first time since the pandemic, um, test scores were, were released uh, yesterday and Hampstead Hills Middle School is the top performing school in our district in reading and math. Our elementary school is, is the third highest in reading and seventh highest in math. And we are a neighborhood school that's not uh, uh, selective. And um, uh, we have uh, just an amazing teaching staff. So student performance, uh, all of the uh, consequent, uh, consequence metrics like detention, suspension, and um, office referrals and attendance all move in the right direction, in my opinion, when a school leader or a district leader fully embraces restorative practices. Thank you so much for that example. I will tell you that there are so many that I've talked to around the nation that are struggling, particularly post-pandemic, with discipline. And the traditional model of punishing and suspending only brings back the same kind of behaviors that were there beforehand. And so restorative practices really provides you a way to disrupt that cycle and really dig in and build meaningful relationships because people don't hurt the people that they love. And particularly with school, I can use that word love because they really do care deeply for the people around them if they also feel valued and honored. And so I really, really well appreciate said. the example. Yeah, well said. In the leadership model that I use to advise others, there's a dimension called leaders learning work. And that's really the mind of an organization's work. And inside that dimension is a term supporting resilience. And so in learning more about you, I have really seen that resilience is an essential part of your work in your school and in the Baltimore City Schools as a, as a whole. I think about a program that you have championed called Leaders Go Places, where children contribute to the common good, they persevere, and, and a number of other components. What does resilience look like in your school? So uh, a lot of people in the education field talk about grit, perseverance, resilience, these um, sort of education buzzwords that are popular today. And it's very challenging to, to say, well, you need more grit or you need more perseverance or you need to you know, just get her done kind of. And that, that, that doesn't really give the lay of the land to a, an adolescent or to a six-year-old or seven-year-old that's struggling. Uh, and it, it's, it's hard work. And I think that as adults in the building, we have to show them and model what perseverance looks like and highlight it. And one of the things that, that we're big on, and this is just an example, but is writing because it's such a synthesis of skills that you need for the rest of your life. And so uh, writing takes a number of drafts, right? You don't just sit down and uh, life is not a tweet. And so you, you definitely need to be able to communicate in writing and having drafts and using technology like Google Classroom to be able to see in real time the editing process. I think that perseverance is a, a much broader discussion than just, you know, um, go do this multi-layered task. Now we have those like portfolio projects are another example of, and every student in our middle school participates in National History Day, which you talk about perseverance, 
Um, that is really getting kids ready for high school and college. And it's not just the high performing, the highest performing kids that participate in National History Day. Every student here does. And getting um, each other, being part of a team, you know, relying on other people, um, all of those traits need to be modeled. And um, then someone will describe you as, as a person who can persevere after you achieve. Matt, what does the term an imperfect leader mean to you? How does that resonate? I think it's a, a genius move on your part to name a podcast an imperfect leader because I think it's just a fact that leaders are not perfect. And when I think of an imperfect leader, I think it's somebody who, I think there's leaders that unfortunately, you've got a range, right? Just like anything, there's a continuum. You got those people who are capricious and arbitrary. And I honestly believe people leave managers, not jobs. And so you're gonna see high turnover. You're gonna see dissatisfaction, low outcomes or suppressed outcomes at whatever level they're working at. And then you're gonna have the um, uh, people who are um, a little bit more command and control, a little bit more like um, maybe they're insecure and it comes off in, in a leader as um, uh, too forceful or too, you know, my way or the highway. And uh, you're, you're, I'm telling you to do this and because of my title, I think you have to do it. And uh, I, that, that is a very stressful situation for the leader and for the staff uh, at district or school level. And then you've got what I think an imperfect leader implies, which is you can be a leader and be vulnerable. You can in fact be the most effective leader and be vulnerable. And that is, um, I think, the only way to be effective. An imperfect leader, leadership and after action is supported by ILAA a firm dedicated to supporting aspiring new and established leaders. For more information, please find them at human-centeredleaders.com. We're back for segment two of an imperfect leader called Imperfect Leadership in After Action. My guest is Matt Hornbeck, principal of Hampstead Hill in Baltimore, Maryland. In this segment, we ask our guests to deconstruct a decision they had to make, and then we discuss it. So Matt, what happened? Thank you, Pete. Um, so one of the things when I thought about this podcast and thinking about um, a time when I made a decision that uh, wasn't necessarily in hindsight, the best decision, early on in my tenure, I was um, really struggling with staff attendance. And a school this size usually has about 550 days a year that we need coverage. And what I mean by that is there's 180 student days but often there's two or three staff members out and we on a given day. And so there's 550 school days when we need to provide coverage. And since the pandemic, it's gone up to about 850 days. And that doesn't include coverage for IEP meetings or student support team meetings, or if someone needs to leave early because their own daycare has called and their own child is sick, but just um, hundreds and hundreds of days of coverage are needed. And it's, it's very difficult for in any district, in any school, as you w well know, to provide coverage and to not split up classes and combine classes when, there's, when, there, when, the, when you are short staffed. And that's just a disaster of a day and results in those teachers actually taking more mental health days shortly thereafter. One of the things that happened here was that um, in our district, you can only take a half day or whole day of leave. And so if a staff member said, uh, if a teacher said, I, I need to leave at one o'clock for an appointment, would you like me to leave at 1130 and take a half day? Or would you like me to just stay and work until one and then leave at one? And um, then I basically have to mark them present for, for the whole day. And so I was getting clobbered on that because, um, uh, you know, it's just human nature. No, no, nobody was doing anything necessarily malicious, but the, the appointments were, were being made um, in the afternoon hours, and people would just leave early. Well, what I decided to do and make an agreement with staff, and it's, it's worked out very well for us, is keep track of late arrivals or early departures. And the way the district had it, had it planned out wasn't working, and the way that I was trying to appeal to uh, altruism was not working. 
And um, I uh, was just trying to follow the rules and it wasn't working um, for us. And so uh, the way I tried to reflect and adjust to, to what was happening was to keep track of early departures and late arrivals so that if a, if a teacher needed three and a half hours of, you know, hey, I got to leave at two o'clock to go uh, deal with the cable guy, or I've got to leave at uh, one o'clock to go deal with somebody in my family sick and I have to get them to the dock, then we keep track of that. And if it doesn't add up to a half day, we don't take any time. But if it adds up to a half day, when it adds up to a half day, we take that. And all of a sudden, when it was up to the teacher to take their time and we were keeping track of it, then all of a sudden the appointments started to be made in the later afternoon after school. And that turned out to be a good thing for kids in learning. Um, so, you know, I think being creative and, and seeing the conditions on the ground is part of the challenge for district and school leaders and feeling like you can um, come up with a solution that works and defend it if the district asks and that uh, sort of your reasonable teacher will get it is a key piece of my work. And that's just one example of how we do it here at Hampstead Hill. So I'm curious about this because often a school will be told, look, we have, we have, we have procedures and this is how it works. And your teacher is out of the building, you haven't marked them out necessarily, and then something happens and all those types of you know, the greatest fears are what are presented to principals and why you can't do things. And it yeah. sounds like you have found a way to do that. What were you learning or what did you learn about relationships when you made this shift from a very restrictive and, and absolute adherence to a rule and found a more flexible approach to honor the people in your building? What did you learn about relationships or what new relationships were formed? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I kind of was um, not mentioning it to supervisors and district staff for many years because I didn't, it was, it was working and it was sort of a um, hush hush. And it's become such an effective tool for us over the last uh, 12 or 15 years that I've told other principals about it and told district staff about it. And, you know, I'm open with it about the union um, and uh, it works for us. I think that ultimately um, superintendents are, and principals are, and leaders in general are, I don't know about often, but frequently put in the position of having to make a decision and apologize later and go ahead and, and, and do something that makes sense at the school level. So much of what we have to do at the school level is a construct, right? Because we're given the policies we're given what the school board and the state board um, have decided uh, is the, the best curriculum, the best policy, the best procedure. And then we have to make sense of it. And um, this, this just made sense as a way to have a win-win. I'm thinking about the question I typically ask about what got overlooked. And it seems to me that from a system level, so not mm -hmm. just at your building, but at a system level, what's getting overlooked is this absolute adherence to a procedure that's been put in place. And I use mm -hmm. procedure different from policy because I think policies often leave things very generalized and then someone interprets it from the district level and creates a procedure. Mm -hmm. But you said from the very beginning, what it was doing was a increasing the number of days of, of individuals being absent. And, mm -hmm. and we certainly know post pandemic, there are more people taking uh, sick days because mm -hmm. there's been a sort of stabilizing or or sort of a, a review of, look, I'm not going to drag myself in there if I'm sick. It does nobody, anybody any good. And so mm -hmm. I'm actually going to stay home if I'm sick. Mm -hmm. um, the piece that really spoke to me or resonated for me was the splitting up of classrooms. If you're in an urban or metropolitan district and to some degree in rural districts, I'm sure mm -hmm. when you don't have a teacher and there is no substitute, you split up the classroom and that fundamentally changes the day for everyone, for the okay. children whose teacher is absent, as well as the teacher who now has welcomed 10 new students into their room. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering from this very long winded question in terms of what got overlooked is that how might the original plan or procedure have sort of solved a problem, but didn't really think about the instructional needs of children and how 
your solution really built in a better pathway so that more predictably children could expect that their teachers would be there? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there, and it's somewhat of a rhetorical question because I think that 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 one of the challenges that school leaders have is um, what you would call bleed time and where where minutes creep away. And um, if you've got, for example, as you know, uh, uh, if you have a chronically absent student and then you have a teacher who is absent a lot in a given year, they are not absent on the same days. And so uh, if the kid's absent three weeks and the teacher's absent three weeks, that's actually six weeks, a month and a half, without um, the teacher and the kid together in the room. And so it exacerbates the most, uh, the, the neediest students, the challenges that the most needy, the, that the neediest students face. And I think that, um, that, that, that it is true that if you've got a procedure is not working at the, at the ground level for practitioners, that um, having leaders who can make game day decisions or implement long-term practices like this one are a great example. And just to piggyback off of that, one of the things early on that happened was that the prior administrator had, who worked here for 11 years prior to me um, uh, had, was, was effective, but had a kind of traditional favorites and uh, no one was marked late in the morning. And, and so when I started, some of the teachers were walking in with the kids well past the contractual obligation to be here 15 minutes before kids. And so um, one of the things I did was start to mark people late at five minutes before kids got here. And um, boy, some of the people really didn't like that. They thought I was um, not treating them as professionals. And I said, you can't arrive five minutes before the kids get here. You haven't taken your jacket off. And um, then the next year, in my third year, we did it uh, at one minute past the time that they were contractually obligated to be here. Now, what that does, and I, it took me, I felt in hindsight, it seems trivial, but uh, it, it was a very difficult thing to do with the entrenched um, uh, uh, way of doing things that had been in place. And what it does is gets not just the the handful of people, because it's a very small group of people who are late every day. It, it has everyone who comes on time aware that I recognize that they're doing not just what they should do and what they can do, but what's good for kids. And then I'm handling the other challenges. Yeah, you were focused on compliance. That is such a tale of all of us who have in our early leadership is that we, we fall prey to compliance over having those conversations or, or as, a, as a community, how do we want to be with each other? What do we want for children? And how do we establish this cultural field that makes us all proud to be here as opposed to you standing at the door monitoring the, the parking lot about when people arrive? Yeah, and we even went so far as uh, I would put a red dot and boy, they didn't like the red dots. And so, I, I'm sorry, it was a red L a red L. And so they didn't like, Oh the my red God, L. Scarlet L. Scarlet Mate. L. Oh, it was, it was really intense. And so they, I said to them, uh, to the handful of people, you know, it's only six or seven people out of, uh, 70, uh, teaching staff. I said, well, what would, what would you want? And they said, how about a green dot instead of a red L? So I'm like, done, let's do the green dot. And then I don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it until the mid-year conference and the end of the year conference. And then if it's two, three, four times, whatever, man, parking was difficult. Um, it's the same as being perfect. I don't make a big deal about perfect. And then if it's 15 or 20 or 30 days, then let's get that going in the other direction. But it's not something that I have to worry about every day. It's not dominating the conversation. You don't have to worry about me fussing at you on a given day. I changed my pattern from those early days to set something up in August that is tenable and enforceable and doable, that uh, great things can happen. It's a synergy that happens when you have a relationship as opposed to uh, a set of procedures or rules. Matt, what advice might you give to a new leader? Uh, be patient, be in it for the long run, see and hear your staff and try to connect with people and be consistent and don't have favorites and ask questions 
and think of yourself as support, not as the center of attention. Think about what, what students and teachers need and the content they need to make the future brighter for all of us. My guest again was Matt Hornbeck. And Matt, as you know, this podcast was designed for aspiring new and established leaders. And in the leadership model that I talked about earlier, there's a dimension called nested patterns. And that really speaks to the way that individuals behave. The, the hope is that these habits you know, become like a muscle, like muscle memory. One term in there is growth mindset. And I'd been somewhat of a fixed mindset on who gets to participate or who would participate on this podcast. And I'm so glad as a principal that you agreed to share your time and your treasure. And so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pete. I really appreciate the opportunity. Music for an Imperfect Leader was written and arranged by Ian Varley. Sam Falbo created the Daruma Doll Butterfly Artwork. Imperfect Leadership is not a scarlet letter. It is a badge of honor. It recognizes that serving as a lead learner is about being a vulnerable leader, an empathetic leader, a compassionate leader. And I'm proud to be an imperfect leader, so I hope you'll join me next time for another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action.